and away we go. Welcome, everybody. I'm Kendra Dixon, and you are watching something we call Stall Talk. Every Tuesday, this is episode number 25, which is something to celebrate in itself. We've been doing this for 25 weeks in a row, and this week is going to be a little bit of a twist. So we're going to have one student come in and work with this one writer in particular. And last week, she made me giggle when she brought it up. But then I was like, you know what? She has a really valid point. And I can certainly relate because in years past, I used to really struggle with um, going by myself, you know, hauling away from home. I, I was struggling at the local level. So I assumed that going bigger and going further away from home, I wasn't going to do any better. But turns out when I finally got the guts to do it, I actually went to the next level. So there were many facets to making that move. And I think, you know, most of it was just a mental shift. But Britt brought up something. She's like, my horse isn't Buddy Sour, but I am. So we're going to talk today about <laughs> like, what do you do when you feel like you're Buddy Sour? When you are, you want to go bigger, you want to enter some bigger races, you want to maybe pro rodeo, but you feel like you haven't conquered your backyard yet. So let's dive into that today. My amazing special guest, co-coaches, wonderful team here, Leanna Ray. Hi, Leanna. Hello. So good to be here, as always. Leanna comes from a background of research and study in the field of neuroscience, which I just super want to nerd out on and learn more. And Michael Richardson, you may recognize him as the host of a show on RFD TV called The Gift of the Horse. And then we've got Martin Patella here as well, founder of Life Enthusiast. So let's dig right in. Britt, are you here today? Are you here yet? Yeah, I am. All right. So I had fun with you last week. You and I did a <laughs> private coaching session. So that let me learn a little bit more about your horses, your program, where you feel like you're stalled, you know, what your biggest challenges are. And um, you sent me some videos of goose. And I personally like the description you gave me of goose. So tell me a little bit about him and what your plans are for him this year. Uh, so we call him Goober. He is, um, well, his name pretty much describes him. Uh, is it good or Goober? Goober. All right, Goober. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> That's us, okay. Tell us about Goober. So he's a six-year-old gelding. He is a double-bred Hancock. He was started. Um, I had a friend of mine start him. He is, um, his foundation is a lot of like reined cow horse. Um, and I bought him originally to start my breakaway career on. Well, I had, I would gotten to kind of a pinch and started him on the barrels. <laughs> so uh, he, um, <clears throat> he's turned out a lot better than what I had originally expected him to be. And I kind of want to keep uh, taking him in the barrel pin for now. <laughs> okay. All right. So you sent in some videos and he's different from the horse, from your good old, honest, trustworthy. So tell us a little bit about Fire. So Fire is an aged mare. Uh, she is also quite a bit of cow horse bred. Um, she is a horse that I bought not too long ago. Uh, when I was really struggling with confidence. And so I bought her specifically because she was older and she has showed me the ropes in the rodeo world. <laughs> it's been very helpful because her confidence has really just oozed onto me and she's been able to really help me uh, achieve a lot more of the goals that I thought would never actually happen. <laughs> is that a picture of her in the background? It is, yeah. That's an awesome picture. So <laughs> Thank are you. you okay if I share part of your review my ride video? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm going to share my screen, guys. Let's start with her. And this is how you first came to Stall Hot, right? You saw review my ride. Yes. Advertised. And what what caught your attention about that? Like, why, why did you invest in that one video review? 
Uh, so you had mentioned um, horsemanship and not forcemanship and really focusing on hand placement. And I knew that that was going to be uh, something that was going to be very helpful for me specifically <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to not drag over barrels on the backside. Okay, so I'm just going to push play. So I went back and I kind of highlighted some of the review so that we could share it today. So if you're new and you're watching on one of the other apps online, like Facebook or YouTube or TikTok, and you're watching this right now thinking, oh, wow, that's that's cool. What is this? It's called Review My Ride. It's a video analysis program where you're going to send in your video and either myself or Michael Richardson here will review your ride and then send you back what we see with tips on how you can change for a much better, smoother, and if what you want is faster, help you get a faster next ride. So I noticed right away, Britt, that this mare is real steady. Obviously, she's got a ton of natural rate. You ride so well, and I love being the bearer of great news because most barrel racers that send in a video to review my ride, ride so much better than they realize. But we tend to fall into the popular methods that like to tear us down and like to have a second guessing things. Um, part of the thing, you know, what we want to really, our big message to the horse world is horsemanship is not forcemanship. So if you feel like you have to do your job, your horse's job for him or her, that's your first neon sign. It should be easy. It should be light. It should be more fluid. And we talk about that a lot in our program. So I noticed this horse was setting in really tight. My first tips for you to watch where that left hock is, like the first placement. And if you'll see where her right tail, it's about to kind of start swinging out. Okay, so if you guys are watching on any of the platforms, maybe you're catching this in a, a later replay. So I like to visualize a door, a door frame that is big enough for my horse to fit through. And I visualize that door instead of a pocket. And I want to be able to drive my horse through that door or that gate opening. Okay, and it's going to be different for a different size horse. But imagine a gate that's big enough for you to run through. And when you start the turn, you don't want your horse's outside hip, in this case, fires right hip, to get hung on the outside, on the right-hand side of that gate. Does that make sense to everybody? Comment for me. Comment if that, if this is the first time you've seen this visual, this is the first time you've used this illustration. So this was my um, recommendation for Brit. This mare is going to need a little bit more room. But please don't call it a pocket because what I have found when people and more traditional or popular style barrel racers hear the word pocket, they tend to want to check with the inside hand, try to lift up that shoulder. And that's what's caused a lot of problems. That's what actually puts a horse's uh, spine in a bind. And you talked about placement. So Britt, and I don't know if Jessica joined us today, but she did a review my ride yesterday. And we talked about hand placement. And I got her email this morning and she was like, Jessica, are you here by chance? Shelly, is Jessica Overstreet here? She said, well, now that you pointed out, it's pretty obvious. Why didn't I see that before? Yeah, she's here, Je uh, Kendra. Okay, Jessica. So I'm excited you made it today. So how did how did that review help you? This is fresh, brand new within the last 24 hours. How did it help you to see it? Were you aware of it before? We'd love for you to hit your camera and your mic so we can say hello. Oh, no, wrong button, wrong button. Hey, hi, Jessica. We got you. Hi. Hey. I don't know if I got the camera to work or not. I'm not very tech savvy. <laughs> Cute glasses. So tell us about the hand placement. 
Well, one of the things that you pointed out in the video that I didn't even notice until you pointed out, made it painfully obvious, was dropping my hand. And you can see the second my hand drops, like it, it just looks like my whole mare, her whole neck and everything gets stiff right there, just in that second. And then we go into this like little tiz. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it was mind blowing to me because it's like, how did I miss that? I've watched that video over and over and over. <laughs> I think it just takes fresh eyes and Leanna, I know you're going to take that and run with it. <laughs> you know, the importance of a team, the importance of mentors and people who've been where we want to go um, to be able to do that, see what we don't see. Leanna, you want to speak on that real quick? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think to see what you don't see because you're in the midst of an experience and our brain registers it when we are in that experience, our brain tends to get super focused, right? And then as we should, but we can lose track of our peripheral and, and the bigger picture, which is why you need that team to come in with that extra pair of eyes because you will co-create. And that's what happens, Kendra, when you are working with a writer is that this capacity to see things differently happens in relationship. Mm. Because it's in the relationship that opens up the capacity to see and feel things differently. Mm -hmm. And the, the visceral along with the thinking have to come together in order to change any kind of pattern. Okay. Well, you just took so much burden off of so many writers mm -hmm. because I used to blame myself. Why am I not good enough? I want this so bad. I want to win so bad. I bet there's not a person here that's willing to work harder than I am. And I just like, I eat, I, I sleep, I dream winning and barrel racing. And it, it seemed like nothing I could, I did or tried would get me out of that stall, get me out of that rut. And now I understand why, because we just get hyper-focused. And like you just said, we lose that peripheral vision. So if anybody's watching, and you want help with that, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Go download the Stall High app and look for online mentorship or virtual training. We're happy to hook you up and help you with your horse. So right here, I drew two circles. A lot of horses who are, I call it barrel happy. Okay, like you remember the dog in the movie Up and he's like squirrel. <laughs> A lot of horses know the routine. This is an older mare we're watching that belongs to Brit and she gets ready early and she goes barrel I know what I'm doing but she's trying to fit her horse sized body through a dog sized door so she's coming in too tight and imagine that horse trying to having to slow down and squeeze through a little bitty space but if we will visualize so instead of a gate here I made it a circle that's big enough for that horse to actually run through and she's got to clear it. She's got to clear it with all four corners. You can't hang a hip. So you can't hang that outside hip as you start that turn. That visual has helped me so much. Britt, have you had a chance to run this mare since we did the review? I did, yeah. And did that help? It did. Uh, I was really struggling with, especially that first and the second barrel um in this video and all summer and I got so happy in my run for getting by first barrel and second barrel that I did not do it at third barrel and I hit it but I was really excited about the changes that I saw on my first and second and I did end up taking the tie down off and really really loved how much it freed her up I'm so happy so you were a little <laughs> you had some reservations like I don't know I did yes uh -huh. All right, so Jessica, you see where her arm is? So her elbow's good. Her elbow's nice and loose. Her elbow's inviting space. But when her hand is low, that's when we your horse is going to feel pressure on the bars of their mouth. So if you'll just, and you see where she's leaning forward right here, it's going to throw right. the mechanics off. So if we just think about the mechanics of a ride, and Michael can definitely elaborate on that. Um what really blew my mind this year, um, one statement um, I heard during stall talk is that mechanical 
errors, when things are not working for our horses mechanically or structurally, it's going to create a mental injury. And people are the opposite. We typically start with a mental or emotional injury that can manifest physically. And that blows my mind, Leanna. Yeah, if I if I can just speak to that, that's that's really powerful. The the what we know through the neuroscience is that the state of my nervous system at some point will cause a story to be opened in our thinking in our brain. Mm -hmm. So I always say the story follows the state. If we hold tension in our body, the brain is going to say why, and it's going to make up a story because we're wired for story. We get a dopamine hit, even if we're wrong. What? Yeah. That's so, how. Yes. So you just, you, you kind of ventured our mind makes up the story. It, it will to, in order to justify why we're in a certain state. Okay. And that is why the work where you had talked about the visualization as I see you drawing these patterns out and we're able to visually see that. I think Michael can speak well to how he has used at some, you know, visualization in the work he does. It really is key because even though our nervous system might be amped up, we don't want our brain to, to fill in a story as if there's something to be stressed about, even though there's not. So having this knowledge allows us to create some space. Sometimes we can say the story I'm telling myself is, it's a Brene Brown, you know, she uses that and it's very helpful because it then allows our brain and our body to go, there might be another part of the story that I'm not seeing for now. And that just allows us the capacity to not get locked into a particular state or story. Ah, not get stalled. Okay, Michael, I'm going to show you this horse. This is Goober. And then I'm going to hand it to you. Okay, so this is the young gilding. I personally believe this horse, when he is, um, when she treats him a little more professional, like gives him the clear instructions that we have in our online library, and teaches him his tracks and then trust him. So we train and then we trust. I personally feel like he's going to mature very quickly this year. This is one run that happened though, that I want you to see so that you can help talk her through it. This is why she's had some reservations on this horse. You hung with him really well, Britt. <laughs> so good job staying with him as long as you did. Michael, I'm uh, you had the platform. Well, well Britt, yeah. Great job hanging with your horse. And and I I think uh Kendra, what you were saying about this horse is is uh very valid because I think he he is waiting for Britt to give him the opportunity to go ahead. And like that little incident, if we can go back, is it possible? Yes. Hold tight. Uh, hold on. Oh, hold on. I clicked the wrong one, guys. I'll find it. While, while she's looking, Britt, I, I, I concur with hand placement. I think that's very, very important. And, and I always try to think about the our shoulder being our hinge. And then we want a line between our elbow wrist through the rein to the horse's mouth. Repeat that, we, please. That's good stuff. I, I was commenting about the hand placement and I think it's very important to, to really consider it and think through because it has such an impact either in a positive or negative way in how the horses will, will perform. So our shoulder being the hinge, and we want a line between our elbow, wrist, through the rein to the horse's mouth. Now, when we add speed to this, it's, it's easy to lift our hand, to bring it out, but we need to consider any time that line is broke, there is a lapse in the communication. 
it's disrupted. So Kendra, to your point, when you're talking about the hand placement, I, it, is, it is so important to understand really because the effects that it has on mm -hmm. the horse's ability to perform and the contact that the bit will make on the horse's mouth. Now, is this a second? See, now, now right here, um, he's already started thinking about what he's going to do on that second. Really? He's yeah. already got it on his mind that he's going to he's break already, it? Well, he's already got it on his mind that there's something that's bothered him. And um, what we need to do as riders is to allow ourselves the time to visualize the ride in every aspect of that ride almost in frame by frame of what we want to to be able to accomplish and if we can't see it we're not going to be able to perform it so one of the things that i i really try to be conscious of in my writing for example is okay you've got you've got your your screen and you've got things that are manifesting on that screen, but you can't hear it. You don't have any volume yet. So you're not being able to get the full effect of everything that is coming about moment by moment of that ability for that horse to, to run and maneuver around the barrel and all of the aspects that come into that. So if, if we go back right there, nope, go forward, a little more right there that's where it started see his head came up his back hollowed out his hind quarters hind legs went back so he wasn't able to push off as much so then he started to pull himself with his front feet there so right there uh right stop so Right there, when his head came up, you and you didn't mean to do this, but what he says is, you hit me in the mouth just for a moment. And that affected his ability to stretch his neck out and lower his head. Now, when we're talking about running barrels and, and the length of reins, all of these things come into play. I believe all the more so importance of where our hands are placed and are we stiff through our shoulders and our neck? Because if we're stiff through our shoulders and our neck, that's going to go right through our hands, our arms, down our hands, into the horse's mouth. And if we're stiff up there in the shoulders, probably more times than not, we're going to be stiff through the swell of our back. Mm. And that tightness will affect the ability for that horse to run more than anything, that ability to soften that top line and come up. If, he, if we would like that horse to soften that top line and, and be able to come up, he's got to be able to stretch his neck out and lower that head ever so slightly. And you've alluded to this in some of the past conversations, Kendra, when you were saying, all right, I want to be able to give that horse his head and be able to allow them to use their head and neck as an aid to balance and an aid to impulsion. And one of the things that I see so much and, and people don't mean to do this, is when you affect that, it's a chain reaction. So when she came around that first barrel, she got him in the mouth just a little bit, and that set the chain of events going to the second and then coming around the second and the effect that it had with the horse <clears throat> bucking a little bit and kind of getting on the muscle. But with all of that, Britt, you did a great job riding it. But notice when you came off, where did he go? Okay, he started all this. He got hit in the mouth. He didn't like that. Took it very personal. But there he went, stopped. So that right there tells me he didn't want to do that. He, he didn't want to do what transpired and, and bucking you off. But because he got hit in the mouth a few times, he took that personal and said, man, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is we need to be aware of these things. And now I would have, I would have liked to have seen coming out of the first, knowing that he got a little bit heavy, potentially, 
uh, mm -hmm. breaking at her hip angle, which is your angle of your hips, bringing your, your torso forward just a little bit, which would have allowed him to be able to come up and uh, through his top line and possibly allowed you to give him that, give him his head and be able to put yourself in a better position going into the second to be able to, as you said, Kendra, very eloquently about that door, which I love that, going through that door. And as you came forward, you lightened up your seat just a little bit, gave him his head. And I, I think he would have come out of that, even though the first he was a little on the muscle, uh, I think he would have come out of that second better. That, and that's just a quick analysis of what I saw there mm -hmm. with, with him. And I, I really like him. I, and I love the Hancock like horse. And I like him, and I, I think Britt, you're really on to something if you'll give this horse a chance. Um, I, I I really like your position of the first video. Um, really quiet with your seat, um, quiet with your hands. You're you're soft. Um, there are times, and this happens to all of us, that we get tense either through our neck, through our shoulders, and that affects our hands and our ability to be soft and help the horse stay soft in the bridle. Um, Right, okay, right there for a minute. See where you're. Okay, sorry. So watch when she leaves this turn. You don't see yep. daylight between her hips and the saddle. She's seated. Correct. Yep. So, so then, right, maybe just a little. Okay, right there. See your lower leg? Your lower mm -hmm. leg came back. Yep. And as your lower leg came back, it disrupted your balance just ever so slightly. And that, in his mind, that kind of set him off. So I, I would like to see it, and you're working towards that, not allowing that leg to come back like that because that throws your upper body off. You lose that balance point. And we talked a little bit about this and I'd love to expound on it more, is foot placement in stirrups. Yes. And, band in the, and they're not allowing that ankle joint to be able to use as, as a form of balance for your whole body. Go on and preach there, Michael. That's my uh, first book that I want to publish. How rubber bands are ruining your barrel horse. They, they like really 99, are. Nine out of 10 barrel racers put them on their boots because they yeah. don't question the anatomy or the mechanics or the biomechanics and really don't even realize how much it's setting their horse back. Oh, oh, tremendously so. You're you're spot on. If if your heel is up higher than the ball of your foot, you're taking away your ability to utilize your ankle and your heel as a form of shock absorption. And when you take that away, then you're gonna lock up your knee, you're gonna tense your knee up, you're gonna tense through your hips. Therefore, that balance point is disrupted and you're not gonna be able to sit the horse like you did the first barrel, going into the second you're already your balance point is already off mm -hmm. and that's that's throwing that horse off and i think really he didn't want to do that but because of all that he says oh i don't know and that was his that was him saying i i need some more clarification i don't understand what you're saying mm -hmm. so that would that be a quick assessment of that right i i think i just found my co-author <laughs> <laughs> that's that's wow good. so yeah. i know what i feel but i sure can't articulate it as well as you just did thank you for that wow Thanks. who else just absolutely that just blew your mind so if you're watching on a facebook channel um tiktok youtube or if you're watching a replay reach out to us and let us know what this stall talk does for you did that illustration just help you? Did you just have a breakthrough bullseye light bulb or lightning strike moment? And if you want to learn more, keep going. Sandy, I see your hand raised. Yes, ma'am. Do you want to contribute? Yeah. My little horse. Um, first, the heel up or the heel not down. I have a great drill for that to help riders get that muscle memory. Mm -hmm. and can you hear me okay i can oh great okay so it is okay to extend to extend your trot and um hold on let me get wind up turn that off okay extend your trot 
it, but stand in your extended trot. When you stand with your extended trot and you position your body so that your legs are underneath your hips, your heels will automatically drop down. And then as you're doing that extended trot, you'll feel your, your ankles as those shock absorbers. And so it will, it will give you that feeling. And if you pretend, for instance, if you're riding, and Mike will probably agree with this, when you're riding, if you can all of a sudden um, just go being and your horse disappears, how are you gonna land? Are you gonna land on your butt, on your front end or on your feet? And if you're gonna mm -hmm. land on your feet, that means that you are balanced correctly and you've got those heels in a good position. So uh, it's a great drill to do. And the other thing I noticed when I was watching that video that sometimes, and I'm not a barrel racer, I, I barrel race, but I'm not a, I don't consider myself a barrel racer at the, the least. However, I do know that in horsemanship, it's important that when you go around a corner, at any kind of corner, whether it be a raining uh, spin or whether it be around a corner in, in a barrel, you need to um, steer forward and not steer back. And I did notice that there were a couple of uh, shots there where she, it looked like, and maybe mentally she was tensing and her arm was, you know, erroneously just kind of pulling back and pulling down and, and, and back. And I might be wrong about this, but it kind of looked that way to me. And I thought I'd pass that along. Thank you. And you hit a bullseye, Sandy, because yes. barrel racing, the, the most traditional, the status quo, and still very popular today, tack adjustment is not in a rider's favor. But because it is our comfort zone, a lot of people are not willing to change. They're not willing to even consider that adjusting tack can change the mechanics and our horse has a better experience because we're so hung up in the way we were spoon fed and told and taught to do it. We're more concerned with making ourselves comfortable than actually, you know, stewarding our horse and thinking about their mechanics and what they need. So I'm glad that we took time to go through this review. Britt, thank you for um, being willing to, to be our, our student and giving us this topic. Um, Leanna, let's get into the buddy sour. Now that you can see her experience, so she's got one horse, rock solid confidence booster. She's got this younger gilding she's bringing along. She's also got a, another mare that's off the track that um, she's seven years old, but still immature. So she's got three different types of horses and it can be, it can be scary breaking away from the local scene and where you don't know anybody, you you don't know what arena you're going to. How do we break out of the stall of being buddy sour ourselves? That's a great start to an even larger, you know, conversation. So the there's a phrase that I hadn't, I haven't, I've heard, but I want to highlight it that you said, train and trust. That's real. That I mean, that is a that is a very powerful uh, connection because I always like to find a point of connection. And it's the question would be, um, what's been the training? How have you prepared the horse and yourself? And if we were to even go back and we talked about sometimes how the brain as, as we're in an experience, we observe. And oftentimes um, back a few years ago when I was working with athletes, um, I would come in and I would say, okay, tell me your injury history. And they would say, yep, injury free. Thank God. And I would say, great. I said, now write down every injury that you observed or that you witnessed a fellow player. And it didn't make sense to them. And not that this, this right now needs to be addressed with, with you, Britt, but here's the point of why I'm bringing this up is because if I've ever seen something go wrong, my brain then registers it in my body as if that could happen to me too because it's our mirror neuron system. It's what I observe, I already place myself in. And so then the athletes would, would comment and they're like, oh yeah, that was career, career ending for him. And that was what we called secondary trauma because I observed it happening. Now, not everyone that observes something happening will take that in right? There's, there's different because we're a spectrum, but you know, when I'm, when we're approaching something that our bodies or our nervous systems have a, a particular feeling about 
my question would be, let's explore the why. What have you seen? What have you heard? What have you experienced? Along with then, and then this is where Michael can come in, is what has been your process to prepare you for this experience of the loading and um, the taking, you know, leaving your place, going somewhere else and exploring? Okay, so do you want her to answer that? What have you seen, heard, or experienced? Absolutely, if you're willing to, Brett. Um, so I have had a lot of personal injuries um, related to barrel racing. Um, I've witnessed a few of them, but I would say, I mean, for me personally, I think that the injuries and accidents that I've been through is probably what plays the biggest part in my head. Um, but yeah, that makes complete sense. Yeah. It's understandable too. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And, um, you get right. What I, why I love these conversations so much. And I think this is, I mean, Kendra, you're the value we're giving people in this 45 minutes to an hour is, is really, um, you can't put a cost on that, right. With what, what we're sharing and what this community is coming to do to talk about, um, is that, we want to hold that with a lot of a compassion for what you've been through and then say, okay, how do we begin to develop a ground now of trust? And when you can understand these body mechanics, right, in the way that Kendra and Michael and the community discuss, you are allowed to have an, a more embodied presence. When I feel secure in my ground, right, when I feel secure in the, in the mechanics and the movement of my body, I can then be more responsive to the experience that is occurring. Does that make sense? And then I can move with that, right? And so that's why understanding the biomechanics of, the, of your anatomy is gonna be so helpful even in developing um, your confidence in what you want to accomplish because I can't wait to hear about the day of when, you've, when, you, when you do this and you're like, I did it and it was great. <laughs> Ooh, I love that you brought that out. So when we address and become more stable, I like that word, stall high. So when you feel more stable and secure in your body, in your rhythm, and you understand the mechanics and they're working for you, guys, it's a two-way street. Not only helps our horse become more confident, but it helps us become more confident because there aren't, uh, what did you say, Michael? You said disruption. I love that word. There was a disruption. There was a disruption that caused a disruption. Oh, hello. Sometimes I've gone through all out turbulence, like more than a little disruption, like, oh man, this is bumpy. And I just felt discombobulated, like not on the same per page with my horse at all, just churning, slinging dirt, like all four legs going different directions. So um, that's an excellent point, Leanna, that when we become secure in the process ourselves, our anatomy, where our body's at, if we are seated securely, that's going to increase confidence. Parallel runs parallel with our horses. Michael, do you want to elaborate on uh, on Buddy Sour and and helping Britt haul to the next level um, without feeling former insecurities? Yeah. Well, I, you know, Britt, you're doing a great job, and first and foremost, I need to say that, and I commend the work that you're putting in, the effort, and and it takes work. Um, but the, the thing to Leanna's point, one of the things that I try to do is I think about it on a, on a fascia level and where my hangups are. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I have, like you, Britt, sustained a lot of injuries. And <clears throat> all of those injuries create just not, not, not hinder. If you, if you give yourself the time to think through the injury, and think through where it's, it's affected you and try to say, okay, I've got to find another way, other channels, and that's where the fascia comes in, to allow my shoulders to work as good as they can, even though the trauma that has occurred. And that could be whatever. And the thing that we, if we don't give ourselves time to think through it on, a, on the nervous system, 
as well as on the fascia level, it's not going to give us the time to be able to process it to the fullest effect mentally. And, and that is, is what will hinder us well before we even go get our horse to take to the trailer to go to the, the event. So if you give yourself time to think about that, and I use a lot of breathing exercises and it, to try to help as I inhale and as I exhale, I blow out all that tension that those hangups that might be in my spine because when we sit on our horse, the, the control center being up here and the energy that goes down through our body, you want your spine to be like a tuning fork and you want it to vibrate in such a way that you're being able to pick all that information up from the horse and being able to transfer that all down to the horse. So we need to give ourselves time to be able to work through that. And the other thing that I do when you're talking about Buddy Star <clears throat> is go through all of this, load up and, and go to an arena. Not, not necessarily go to the competition, but just go to an arena, maybe get your horse out, walk him around, get on him if, if it feels good, and then give yourself time again while, since you've arrived to think through all of that and then load them back up and go home. And that's kind of like saying, okay, if I've got an area that we work really good in and everything clicks, but I go to a bigger arena, a bigger event, and it gets a little sticky, go back to that small arena and maybe do that a few different times. And pretty soon that's going to transfer through the experience to the, the bigger event, the bigger arenas. And you'll find if you let yourself and give yourself the opportunity to work through these things, and like Leanna was saying, and Kendra as well, uh, the time, you'll find that each time you go, it'll get better and better and better. Okay. A tuning fork. We want our spine to be like a tuning fork to that horse. I've never heard anybody say that before, but I want it. That is my goal. And I feel like, Michael, just, and I'm so proud, um, Britt, that you're part of our online mentor uh, program absolutely. because we're seeing really interesting results. Leanna, it is amazing to have the experience when we have an in-person event, like we're having uh, April 1st and 2nd, the Moody Mayor Makeover Clinic, when people can come ride with us. But this online mentorship program, since we started it January a year ago, I'm seeing better results from my riders than I did in 13 years of teaching in person. Absolutely. Because, because it's consistent. I can't possibly put nearly 50 years of my life in the saddle. I can't give that to you. Even if you spent the whole summer with me and we worked every day, just committed yeah. on you. I can't possibly give you my lifetime of experience in that short amount of time. And most clinics, you're riding in a group, you know, of, of one to 25 riders. Um, it's a two-day course, so you're getting a very teeny tiny snapshot of it. Or if you go ride in person, that's where I feel like all of this foundation, all of these conversations, when you are prepared ahead of time, you can really capitalize on that window, that opportunity to ride in person. But that's why we're seeing progress because we're we're pecking away a little bit every day and it's consistent and it's repetitive. And um, I'm just, I'm just so excited about this. I, I feel like this is our opportunity to explain the process because mm -hmm. a lot of people will agree right now, tuning fork with our horse, my spine, that sounds awesome. How do I do it? Yep. Mm -hmm. We're going to want to know the how to, and that's what we get into every night of the week <laughs> at Stall High. That's what the mentor program is all about. So Leanna, how do you explain nervous system, nervous system? How is our spine a tuning fork? Oh, it's beautiful. Um, it's a beautiful concept. And I, and I love, I love that because the tuning fork is in resonance with its environment and the, um, especially coming from Michael, um, the, the, the view from his perspective, being in a, it, being in a chair, a wheelchair, right. He's been able to access those parts of himself that he physically can't make contact with. Wow. Right. So when he 
gives when he gives these analogies or his process, right? When we visualize outcomes or experiences, what's happening in the brain is it's actually laying down an experiential pathway as if we've already been there, done that, and can do it again. Come on. Right? I know. And so, and the key is, is that the, the visualizing it in detail. So it can't be just a big broad, this is where the details and the nuances do matter, right? And so, and the brain picks up on that. And when we do that, we activate a particular part of our brain that begins to scan for the opportunities to engage and utilize what we visualized and um, the tools that we, that we hold within us. And really, here's the thing at the end of the day, what I'm hearing is you are the best tool for your horse. I mean, you can have all the, the accessories and it's not about that, but that you are the, you are the very best for your horse simply because you're together. And the, um, there was a comment here from Harrington saying, how do we get over those? I've had several injuries, um, over the years. And, you know, that's a great question. It, it can be layered, but I will say that, um, what you can do moving forward and I can email about some other things to, to you. Um, but that when something happens that is dysregulating for our nervous system, if we can sit with it and work through it, as Michael would say, physiologically, even within three to four hours of that experience, we do not take it in as a high stress incident. We decrease, does that make sense? So we have an event that shook us up, right? Uh, we became dysregulated. If within that three, four, six hours within that day, if we can go back and process that with a listening partner, maybe somewhere, you know, someone here in Stall High Community and say, I want to talk through this experience. And if you can regulate your breathing pattern, if when you are reflecting on that experience, if you can feel in your body where you're storing that hold. Mm -hmm. And you can breathe into it and let that fascia unwind, right? We are, we are reworking that experiential pathway that just got laid. And so it's not, so we're, so in other words, it's not being dug deep, right? And we can actually affect how our brain and our body stores that experience. And, and, and once you say to Leanna for that, then you're, you're developing a story. And with yes. that story. Your, your brain and your body, and your nervous system wants to go back to. Yes. Even, that's even when, go ahead. No, that is correct. And so what we're, what we're doing, and you can do that even with past experiences, by the way, but uh, I want to encourage people this for moving forward that you have, that if you can work through that, that's exactly it. Um, you create um, more space in your nervous system, not to create a story of judgment and uh, uh, agenda or expectation but we're, you know, we're able to be that tuning fork now. Yep. We're rewriting the story the way yes. we want it. Instead yes. of feeling like we're stuck in a rut or stalled or stifled. Yes. Well said. Ah, this is good. Martin, do you have anything to add this week, sir? No, this is uh, definitely not my wheelhouse. <laughs> I'm learning. It's good to see. I mean, I, I could talk to my personal injuries and how I've managed to cope with that and whatever, but that's not relevant. I think Leanna's doing a very fine job of explaining the neurology of it. Does it make you want to ride a horse? Um, I think it's kind of late in life for me to start again, but maybe. I mean, I, I reflect on my horse riding experiences and they were all totally badly coached so um you know when you get off on the wrong foot it's it's really hard to get it right yes you've said that before yes. the first cut is the deepest so our first experience is the strongest both for yeah. ourselves and our horses take it serious invest make it quality time it is very yeah. valuable Britt let's hear from you what'd you learn today has this has this been helpful for you and you feel like you have information now that you've been equipped and empowered to think differently when you load up and go again? 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've been taking notes over here. I have <laughs> like three pages and uh, yeah, this has been mind, mind blowing. <laughs> Very helpful and I appreciate everybody. Thank you. Does it help you not to feel like you don't have control? Like sometimes I would just, I didn't understand why I was feeling that or why I was stuck. But once I have a, like a scientific comprehension, there's an explanation of it. I'm like, oh, that's what it is. I'm not the one, like I, I took on the blame. I thought something was wrong with me instead of there was just something missing. There was just information I didn't know yet. Does that help? Yes, tremendously. <laughs> That's exactly what I was. I was like, well, what, what's wrong with me? Why can't I? And so this whole talk today has been really, really great. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. It's just that I believe as an industry, we've missed a lot. We've missed a lot. We're so focused on the almighty clock and, and outrunning ourselves, you know, from last week that we miss the obvious sometimes. Jessica, let's hear from you. This is your first week, your first step into anything stall high. Was this helpful? This was very helpful. This is, I really don't even know how to describe it. Like I was really excited about the review my ride and I was really excited about this and I expected to get information out of it to help me, but I didn't expect to get this onslaught of information. Like I've, I've got notes over here too. <laughs> Me three. <laughs> so I'm, taking them, I'm taking them also. And um, I am, I'm so honored to be on this journey. I never realized this. I kind of knew where I wanted to go. I didn't realize how much it would impact me personally. And I, I didn't even know I was stalled. I mean, it was pretty obvious that I didn't stay in the top 15 long enough to make it to the NFR. That's where my heart is. But I didn't understand all of these explanations. And now it, it makes sense, which makes it seem a lot more doable now. I feel so much more capable. I feel that we do. I do local play day shows. I have aspirations to do big things, but I've been thinking if I can't even run in the 3D at home, why can't, why do I need to go anywhere else? And, but it's like here in this today, it's like, you know what? I'm going to do it one day. We're going to yes, get there. Okay. Leanna, close us out, land the plane. Do we have to be winning the 1D before we venture out to test a bigger environment? No, no, you do not. It, absolutely not. Um, you are follow your inclinations, right? I, that is the, one of the biggest things is that we have these inclinations and often we then try to suppress or diminish them. And so my question will always be what, it, what is a glimmer within you? And when you see that, or when you name it, like you did, Jessica, you follow that because the story's writing itself. Good stuff. Follow your inclinations. Right. Leanna Ray, thank you for blessing us with your experience and your expertise today. Learning from everyone. Thank you guys for every, everyone being here. It's a beautiful time. Michael Richardson. Well done, sir. We're going to we're going to have to talk some more because I'm serious. I would like help writing this book about rubber bands and how they're ruining our barrel horses. And I know that's going to be highly offensive to most barrel racers. But for those who are willing to listen to what you just said, you articulated it. Um, I've been I've been learning more about how our knee is a natural shock absorber. I didn't. I didn't go down to the foot. I didn't think about the ankle. I know what I feel. I didn't know how to say it as well as you said it today. So you absolutely knocked it out of the park once again. Thank you, sir. It, it's a pleasure to be here and I always uh, love to hear all the, all the contributions. It's great. Happy to be here. Well, thank you, Martin, for being here as well. Martin Patella of Life Enthusiast. Thank you, Merhow Trailers. Uh, if you haven't pulled a Merhow, you need to test drive one because once you pull a Merhow, you won't want to pull anything else. Um, uh, if you want, if you're in the Missouri area, go to Cowtown USA. They are a Merhow dealer. If you're curious about what's happening here, 
Like, what have you just clicked into? Download the Stall High app. That's how you can get started. It's a free download. I'm showing this to my TikTok audience right now as well. It's a free app. It's for horse people. Inside of Stall High, there's an online mentor program. You can get started with Review My Ride. That's where you submit a video. We're going to run it through the software, slow things down, and point out the mechanical disruptions that we see so that you have a visual. And we're going to help you to start to just peel back the layers and process things in a new light so that things become very clear to you. For me, I was one of those barrel racers that bought in hook, line, and sinker, and I just wanted to be a good student. And I never questioned the techniques and the drills that I was being taught because they'd always been done that way. It was just face value. This is the way you do it. This is the barrel racing bit. This is the barrel racing saddle. This is the barrel racing feed. This is how you approach your pocket. And it wasn't until, unfortunately, I ruined a lot of horses. I lost... I don't even know. I want to, I don't want to know how much money I lost and how many years I lost just spinning my wheels and chasing my tail in frustration until one lady liberated me from following the crowd. And she taught me how to listen to my horse. So if we have your attention, if your ears just went up and you want to learn how to do this and you want a mentoring team to coach you through the steps so that your learning curve doesn't do this or do like mine did and go all over the place like a balloon that just got let out of air and you want us to help flatten that learning curve we're here for you download the stall high app i'm kendra dixon and i'll see you if you're in the inter interactive group at stall high i'll see you tonight at six o'clock otherwise everybody else in uh, online on any platform i'll see you right here next week for stall talk thanks everybody great job thank you bye and thank you Bye, Shelly. Bye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bye, guys.